Well, welcome everybody to this special event um, convened for London Craft Week uh, 2021. We're grateful, of course, to the, the Craft Week who've given us space on their platform uh, to highlight students' work. And in particular, that of recent graduates from two courses at London College of Fashion, uh, University of the Arts. So MA Fashion Artifact and MA Fashion Footwear, which will be will be the focus of our of our discussion this afternoon. My name's Judith Clark. I'm Professor of Fashion and Museology at London College of Fashion and co-director with Amy Delahaye of the Centre for Fashion Curation. And I have the wonderful role of London Craft Ambassador for the Michelangelo Foundation, and I'll be your chair this afternoon. So just about the format of the session um, and the hour that we have together. So we'll talk for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we'll dedicate the rest of the time to, to questions. And so if you want to put questions in the chat box, um, even during the session, uh, that's fine. I'll pick them up at the end and, you know, I'll read them out at the end and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. Um, do feel free to write them as a question to one of the panellists, if you'd like, or as a general question, that would also be, be fine, but special, you know, specify if you would like. So, um, first of all, it's my great pleasure to interview to interview, to introduce and interview our wonderful panel of experts. Um, so I'm just going to read out a couple of just very short biographies uh, of our of our panel uh, that do them no justice at all because they're such short introductions. Um, so I'd like to uh, first of all introduce Naomi Filmer. I don't, will you put up your hand perhaps, maybe your name is on your screen, um, mm. who convened this panel. So I'm very grateful to her. And she's currently acting course leader for the MA Fashion Artifact at London College of Fashion, having taught on the course for a number of years. She's a contemporary jeweler, a designer and artist who describes her work as objects about the body. She gained her master's degree in metalwork and jewelry at the RCA in 1993 and acquired very quickly a reputation for catwalk collaborations with designers such as Hussein Shalai and Alexander McQueen and Valerie Hash. Um, and her work appear in international contemporary fashion and applied art exhibitions recognized um, always for their sculptural forms and, and experimental use of materials. And her voice as, as one at the, the uh, boundaries between art and accessories, I think will, will be fed in uh, later on and is key to this debate. Uh, Ilka Mora, if you'd like to, to also, is course leader for the MA Fashion Footwear at London College of Fashion, uh, the other course that we will be looking at in particular today, and has his own studio practice as a, as a practice-based researcher, an artist designer. His own practice and output includes designs for industry, bespoke and catwalk pieces, interior design objects for galleries, installation, performance, and short film. So his work has been exhibited internationally in places such as, as the Boymans von Boynigen uh, in Rotterdam, uh, MAD in Paris, FIT in New York, the Saatchi, the British Council, the Design Museum, and the list goes on. And so I think some of his work kind of investigating methodologies and, and making the processes and practices of making uh, is also key to, to our discussion. Georgina Goodman, uh, who barely needs an introduction. Her work as a designer and her two nominations as accessory designer of, of the year and high profile collaborations include ones with uh, designers such as McQueen, Luella Bartley, Casade, amongst others. And her creations are housed in museums internationally. It's, how, it's however, I believe a new direction that her work is taking, um, as well as her role as visiting tutor on both the courses that we're looking at today, uh, that will be the focus of her contribution this afternoon. And we're very grateful um, that, she's, that she's with us um, today. And last but not least, Jo Cope, uh, who is um, a, a, a Leicester-based artist and conceptual designer, and importantly for today's uh, debate, is an alumni of the MA Fashion Curation 
uh, fashion artifact. And she currently lectures on numerous fashion related MA and BA programs across the, the uh, UK. So is also engaged in, in the education side um, of, of practice and, and drawing on the boundaries of fashion, art, craft and performance. Her work has been represented at events worldwide, including importantly, the Venice Design Biennale recently and exhibited internationally in museums, including um, the Budapest Museum of Art and the Decorative Arts Museum in Paris. So um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the film that was, uh, that was posted as a link with the Eventbrite invitation and some images from which have been just um, being shown during this introduction. So I'd like to acknowledge the film in a way that, that is, is the focus of this session um, that is on the Craft uh, Week website. And I recommend everybody watches the entire film if they haven't already done so. So it splices together six films, all of which are importantly, I think, made during lockdown. And so created in, um, in different countries, of course, and so far from where their community and um, classes would, would congregate. So I want to start with the brief the students were responding to and the rather unique circumstances they were working with. And I'd like to start uh, with Naomi and then Ilko, if you would, um, as, as uh, driving uh, the course, those courses, whether you could tell us the parameters with which these students were um, we're working within. So situate the brief for us, if you would. So Naomi, if you would like to kick start on what, what kind of brief were these students responding to? Well, all of the uh, film pieces, clips that we see today in the film loop are represent their presentation of their final master's collection. So all of them are essentially responding to the brief of it's the final unit is the final element of the whole course. It's where they're asked to design and make a collection of work that represents the learning and the experience that they've gained through across the whole MA. Um, we don't ask them necessarily to make a film. So each of them have actually taken that, that step further unless it was in conversation with the tutor to be for the film to be part of the um, submission. Um, so, so yeah, the, it's, it's their master's project, essentially. It's about how they culminate. It's the culmination of all the learning and the previous experience um, throughout the curriculum. So there's, there are differences between the two courses, uh, but essentially, yeah, it's the, it's the final shebang. It's, it's the bringing together the studio practice, the contextualized, of the, the whole design project that they put forward, um, their research methods informing their design development, where they position their work in relation to the body, where the craftsmanship and the manufacturing processes um, also direct and fuel the outcome, how the dialogue between all of, of the above mentioned um, correspond with each other, and, and there you have the, the master's collection. And yeah, for, for food wine, it's obviously the same structure. Um, I think um, um, the basis is always the study proposal for any type of um, uh, uh, project. I think with these two, particularly, uh, Yuzao wanted to make, uh, didn't want to work in the traditional uh, footwork context. He wanted to experiment and play and so on. Um, and make object-based work. And um, uh, Rosmia came from an architecture background in Pakistan, and she's very um, socially engaged and politically engaged already. I think with both of the people and with all of the other people, um, I think what we aim to do is to make their work uh, relate to something which is socially relevant beyond their personal interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the design element. Um, you know, so it's not only an expression, but it's also a, a, um, something that can exist and, and resonates in a particular context of their own choice eventually. Yeah. And Georgina, I don't know whether you want to comment on 
um, in terms of your interaction with the with the students, um, whether there was something that you you felt um, you know came through particularly eloquently this this year, and given their con the conditions of, of the production. I think they had to be um, ingenious. You know, they had to think of different solutions. Um, we're we're both. Uh, both courses are within the craft umbrella. So there's going to be elements in some collections that are completely handmade. There's going to be elements that are 3D or digitally made or virtually um, or, or, or exist virtually. So people were being more um, imaginative. Um, you know, we see this with, with, with Leia most particularly who was making a material at home in her kitchen. Yeah. So I think perhaps that project wouldn't have evolved had there not have been a kind of element of being locked in your, your, your home. So we, we saw from both cohorts just um, this sort of level of imagination that perhaps we, we, wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have seen before. Um, and also a lot of support of each other, which I felt was really lovely you know to for people to support each other and and sort of give comment on each other's process so that was something very interesting yeah and joe obviously you've done one of the courses you did um you trained with the ma fashion artifact um did you feel despite the the conditions that the students were working within something that was recognizable to you having obviously studied at a very different time to these students you were in situ um, and and whether you feel there was some there's something that is an attribute of the course as in whether there was a there was something being pushed a, a, a kind of a questioning of the very practice that they were engaged um, within that you recognized to be a trait of the course Yes, I think, um, first of all, I just want to say, um, yeah, thanks for having me. And also a huge congratulations to all of the students, because obviously I know how hard it is. And I know the concept of having to be in um, the studios to succeed and the workshops from, you know, 8 a.m. in the morning until you get kicked out at night. And so I was asking Naomi, you know, what were the circumstances this year? Because all of the work looks so wonderful and beautiful and so um, amazingly crafted, which is obviously a core um, part of the course. Um, I think the filmic element is so relevant this year and particularly in terms of the kind of um, the COVID situation and um, post-Brexit and um, the idea that their craft can travel virtually. And I thought that they were really amazingly executed. So I thought that was, you know, brilliant in, in general. Um, I think the core values of the course is to constantly question across both um, footwear and fashion artifacts, um, is to constantly question the status quo. And I think that, you know, I was looking from the outside, looking at these films for the first time and really connecting with them and they were so current and also future um they were they were projecting um you know political um social all the current issues um which i think is really key is that both courses constantly address what should we be talking about now how can we communicate that through the beauty and the voice of craft particularly so so yes definitely because the film obviously adds a different narrative layer, doesn't it? Because there's the layer, there's the making, and then there's the framing and presenting, which is a whole includes a whole other set of skills, doesn't it? I mean, it's a, it's kind of over and, and above the skill of making something, as you say, so exquisite that as as we've seen, but some uh, chose to work virtually, you know, to work as a render, um, and I want to. Uh, ask uh, Naomi and Dilko again about your relationship to the digital um, in in this context. You know that that it's about thinking through making, and what happens when that is 
taken to its extreme logical consequences as in into the imaginary or into a projected other reality that still is very engaged with the body and with, with a kind of emotive design, but that isn't linked to the skin, so to speak, or the, the materiality of, 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 um, of what you're, you're making. And so Naomi, I don't know whether you want to comment on that, uh, about, about that other dimension. Well, I would, I would refer to Chris Bronstein's um, film in the loop and he actually did make two main submissions for his his final master's collection which was the, the movie you see but also a bronze sculpture so there was a physical element and actually he was quite clear about how the crafting of a digital animation um, needed to be in conjunction with the physical object so that the dialogue was not only removed from physicality but it was another it was another material really in order to craft through his ideas and, and deliver in a digital format. I'm not experienced in digital animation at all, um, but I nevertheless I think in terms of it being a, a conversation where you question uh, the crafting of objects in relation to the body, but actually using a digital crafting in, instead or in conjunction, not instead of, but in conjunction with, I think it's interesting. I think it broadens the, the dialogue, the spectrum of materiality. Um, and they, there is inevitably, yes, a very, very much a removal from live flesh, or, or yet I think he um, makes real effort and to assimilate uh, fleshy su suggestions, really fleshy interpretations, skin interpretations, but it's very autobiographical also that piece of film for him um, and mm. talking about body dysmorphia. So it's a way for him to visualize uh, uh, process uh, an experience, so an experience and, and a condition that was is very uh, physiological. So for him to ex explore that through the digital, I thought was very, was very interesting. Um, yeah. But he was, as I said, he was very clear that it had to be in conjunction with a physical object that in fact was the, the three-dimensional realization of the main form that morphs in the film. Yeah. So that they and that they are shown together always in parallel. So he therefore also explores this space between the physical and, and the virtual or, or the digital anyway, um, between moving image as a flat um, experience on screen and then something that is not moving, that is very static um, and very traditional in terms of the material. Uh, manifestation the material presentation and and the positioning on the kind of classical pins so he was he was looking at that space in between in various contexts with, within his own brief yeah and ilko there are two the two um uh films that that obviously um uh, come under your umbrella are very different because one is showing um an object morph in a way that is is the um, the performer, let's say, is is showing. It's like a show and tell of a, a kind of extraordinary um, number of combinations of the components of of the object. And the other, with bringing in the domestic, is incredibly uh, narrative in terms and and political. Um, how important do you think the films are in terms of underlining? the kind of the conceptual you know that 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 those narratives were very important to see performed if you like yeah well you know i think for me it's not necessarily um well they are important because but not in the sense that you know it's, it's not it's not necessarily a, a virtual different reality i mean the first the first object is is prescriptive. It's just you know um, every object is I think um, has a narrative anyway. So it's fictional to to a large extent and in any case. But um, the first one is just a prescriptive video, uh, which is excellently executed I think. Um, and uh, the second one obviously is descriptive, right? Uh, yeah. Tell the story. And I think I always find that it's important for an object uh, to. Uh, 
to have two functions you know you have that in the commercial world as well with food where it needs to look good when it stands on its own and it's uh, intriguing and so on and then it also needs to uh, to to function well for whatever the purpose is communication or you know um, physical function um, I think uh, it's not necessarily also something I think that's uh, that's particularly done within this period of time, COVID. It's it's just that I think footwear students have done more often to um, to show how the object is used. I guess it's maybe it's a little bit of a design product approach, which you see it a little bit more. Um, and I think especially with when objects start to question things and they become a little bit stranger, uh, let's say. Um, it's important to show how they operate because within the object is the world, right? So you need to envisage that. Don't know yeah. if that answers the question. But... Yeah, no, it it does. I mean, Georgina, do you feel that that your work collaboratively, both on at catwalk, at, you know, in terms of catwalk presentations that are so narrative, um, that that this has given you a different sort of way into these conversations through those kind of dialogues where you're where you're performing something uh in relation to 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 an idea that is is a kind of designer's uh, kind of vision does this kind of resonate to you um with you and the other thing is is how you're kind of moving away and around uh, from that in your work at the moment? I, th I think um, I'll answer the, 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 the first question. I think the first is you have to sort of put your head into, I mean, as a designer anyway, you get used to putting your, uh, opening your mind to ideas and trying to kind of filter those ideas and, um, and feedback and help. And I think when you're working with either either artifact student or a footwear student they're both dealing like you're using the same brain really because what you're doing is you're asking what do you what do you want to do what and why why do you want to do it and let's work out how you're going to do it so that's very similar to if you if i was working with a you know with a catwalk designer but i've this conversation i want them to People to feel like they're falling off a mountain and you have to like make your embody what filling off a mountain feels like so it, it requires empathy so any working with anyone who's another creative requires you to collaborate with that person so it's a collaborative experience working with the students especially at MA level well it should be because <laughs> when it's not a taught course um, and I can't I can't remember if I've answered the second question or whether or not um, I've what was the what was the second part of the question? Well, Sorry, Judith. Kind of what direction your own work is taking? You know, we're we're talking about the the course, but we're also talking about where they find their inspiration, and and yeah. it, of course it's mutual. But where your own yeah. work is coming? Well, you know, you know, um, the the thing that I find most exciting working on between these two courses is I'm constantly being asked to research new materials come up to speed. If I have a student who says, oh, I want to make a, whatever, a virtual shoe, I have to learn, every, I, I try and learn everything I can about that process in order to, just to have a conversation. You know, you have to, uh, you, you do have to kind of um, educate yourself all the time. And I think that's the most exciting thing about teaching. And um, uh, materials can change the whole process, you know, if you start working in one material and change the material, you've got to work out how these two materials fit together. Footwear it is so difficult to make if you want to wear it, you know, it requires so much technique and you know, we have amazing technicians and we rely on so many different brains to, to, to help the students create. And that's very much like the industry, you know, you're not one person, it's a whole group of people working together. Yeah, so, and I think when when you look at the um, at the, at the general uh, website, the London College of Fashion kind of degree presentation, you can see shoes, boots, sandals. It's not. I mean, what we're talking about today is obviously at one end of the spectrum, but you can also see kind of recognizable forms, if you like, uh, 
at, you know, exquisitely made at, at the other. Um, Joe, I wanted to, to, um, to ask you about kind of, in terms of underlining a narrative through, um, through these objects and the, um, and through shoes in particular, about how to politicize work and how to, to, um, to give it a social conscience, if you like. And I just wondered whether you would tell us about your work uh, working with shelter, you know, that, that, that sometimes the, the kind of extremes and the kind of, kind of interdisciplinary nature of these projects caught a different kind of relationship or a different kind of, of uh, collaboration. Yeah, I think, um, so with the work with Shelter, I guess, first of all, um, as with a lot of the work that we're seeing today from these amazing students, it the work starts with often uh, an inner, inner belief or something that you're experiencing personally, something you care about, something you want to change, um, something you're interested in. So I think there's that kind of core starting point of why we create an object. Um, and then for me, it was about saying, what is our wider role within society? What is that deeper impact we can have? And, you know, can an object be that powerful? How can an object um, touch people's lives or, or have these, um, yeah, you know, um, deeper impacts um, for change? So, um, Briefly, the work that I do with Shelter now is as a creative consultant, and um, this really came out of this gap, trying to bridge a gap between charity um, and creating another voice. And I truly believe, and this is the work of, that's happening within Artifacts and Footwear, um, is that they are this vessel for visual communication, um, empathetic vessels, um, objects that can embed a story, embed a meaning, and then relay that um, to other humans. And I think the point is that we were trying to do with the Shoes Have Names um, project, which was taking 10 footwear designers, some of which were alumni from London College of Fashion. This was for last um, Craft Week 2020, um, and 10 homeless people. It was all about positive stories and it was about creating shoes that talked about their journey after being homeless. And um, I think that's that's a really important point. But also when you have a clipboard, you know, the problem that charities have got or, or people when they're trying to get social messages across, I think women's aid is a really big one at the moment that's trying to do this. You're trying to reach people, you're trying to get a message across. You've got your clipboard and you're talking about, you're, you're using words and they're very cold, you know, just sort of people feel like you're trying to sell them something. Suddenly you put a wonderful object of craft in front of somebody and you start to talk around the stories and, and really unpack everything that's been embedded in them. Then you start to get, I mean, you know, at the Shoes Have Names exhibition, we had people you know, in tears, we had people telling their own stories. Um, so yeah, I think that it can be really profound in the way that that can be used. And, and I definitely saw that in, um, you know, some of the work, um, yeah, some, some of the work, there was um, Zhang Yang with the um, displacement of homelessness. Um, she was bringing that out in really beautiful ways that I felt came across from an outside perspective. Um, there was lots of kind of almost survival and overcoming. Um, it was very beautiful. It, it, it was similar to the way that Shelter wanted us to talk about it. They said, people have suffered enough. We don't wanna make objects that show holes in shoes or what they've suffered. We want um, the objects to be um, really empowering and beautiful. And I think that student did that really well. And Ilko, I wanted to ask you, because part of a, a fundamental um, part of your research is, is into this, isn't it? It's into the, the kind of emotive um, within the process and the relationship between the object and the user. Do you want to comment on any of the work that we've looked at in relation to that? Yeah, well, I was just, 
I just got thrown out, so I'm just back. I don't know exactly what was being said or what question Joe, answer, Joe answered, but. Um, uh, it was about it was about underlining um, the eloquence of work and you know and and harnessing a kind of social conscience within within that uh, uh, within that eloquence. But it's it's fundamental to your own research, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for myself, I use objects as as I said before a little bit. I mean, I mean every object has a function, uh, but it also has a as a, as, a, as a fiction, isn't it? It's a, the fictional objects. You know, we come up with them all kinds of new ones all the time um, for all kinds of functions that we don't really need or you know we think we need. So I think that opens up a lot of space for narrative um, in itself already, the object and its meaning itself, but also actually the function of the object and the psychology of using something um, uh, is also a narrative in itself. And I think thinking about those things um, uh, you know, in the past they made paintings, right, uh, to, to critique something, uh, but now we've got a world of objects, and um, uh, I think they open up lots of possibilities to use those objects to, to um, uh, yeah, make us think about, you know, how you want to live and how to propose um, uh, alternative realities for that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and Naomi, what about the body? Because the body has always been central to your own research and, and bodies have taken on a different, um, perhaps meaning over the last couple of years because we, we have to think of, of alienation or loneliness or distance or distancing, et cetera, to, not, to try not to be too banal because we've spoken about this so much over this year, but inevitably, if then you're creating objects around the body yeah. um, in this time that we find ourselves in, in, invariably there's going to be some kind of commentary on that. What have you noticed about that? Um, in recent, in, in recent students, I think uh, there's definitely, well, there's a lot of attention to mental health and how that manifests or can be manifested through the body. Um, and I think that's across the board. I don't think it's particular to our courses. Um, I think that's across the board, but in terms of, I find what's helpful about teaching on this particular course and having the body, not only in my work, but through the narrative of how we work with the students. Um, it's inevitably a subject that people understand because everyone's physical experience of the world is through their own body. So there's always a very personal perspective on, on approaching the body. Um, some students are more in connection with their own body than others. Um, but it's, it's a theme and it's a red thread that is consistent. Um, but I would say the recent perspective on it, I, I think there's more, more questioning and more intimacy. Um, Students were kind of casting their own bodies and drawing themselves a bit more than usual, probably during that particular cohort in the lockdown. They were confronted with them being alone, confronted with being with themselves, and inevitably, therefore, the conversation of where's the positioning of their body, the body within their work, became more confronting. Um, I'm not sure. You can see that definitely is very apparent in, in Chris's work, in Zon Yang's, I think, as well, in terms of this balance and this idea of kind of local environment, the way she built these structures that are uh, almost kinetic and move in relation to her, her own movement, but not necessarily in rhythm, where there's kind of almost autonomous movement. So there's that. Leah's relationship with the body, working with the rice pulp, she talks about um, nutrition and nourishment, um, and the smell of the, the experiencing the material in the process of making. So she talks about the body through experience and senses and sensation. Um, I think, yeah, there's definitely a much more intimate attention recently with students' relationship with their body that must have somehow been relative to the lockdown. But it is a continued conversation that I never get tired of. <laughs> Um, and I think you can return to that, the theme of the body again and again. You change the context, you change the material, you change the person. It's always fresh. It's always relevant. Um, yeah. 
inevitably. It seemed there was a bit of sort of a back to basics also with that particular project using um, rice pulp, uh, you know, in terms of a, a kind of back to back to one's origins or back to back to basics, mm -hmm. I think was one of the words that she used. Georgina, did you feel that in your practice over the last couple of years? Did you sort of feel, okay, a kind of re restarting of something or a reconnecting with 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 the kind of origins of your interest in this? Definitely. I mean, I think as my career progressed, I got further and further away from the very thing that I absolutely loved and that was making. And as you get more successful or perceived to be successful or you work harder, you just make more stuff. And I had an, a sort of a, a really big reaction to this creation of stuff. And that creation of stuff comes with you as a designer sitting there and drawing it out. So, you know, thousands and thousands of drawings and you're just creating more and more objects that then people buy and consume and ultimately they don't feel good about themselves. And that's the cycle of fashion. And I think the, 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 that theme is running through, it was finally filtering through and that, uh, and we see it through our students, that they are now as a matter of, you know, the first port of call is material use, sustainability, ethical, you, you know, the ethical consumption. And during lockdown, we saw a lot of people actually looking at the amount of rubbish they were creating. And packages coming in the door and you know we had several projects that dealt with um with packaging or um plastic a lot of plastic um which we were kind of like please don't melt plastic at home in your kitchen so you know that was a bit worrying um lots of paper pulp and and homesickness so Leah's that it was the smell of rice that linked her back so that was that sense so that was um so for me going in my sense, my sense of touch, I stopped touching, I mean, I'd feel leather and, you know, but I wouldn't actually make the whole object. And so I started to reconnect with my own, um, my own need to, to make through metal. So I um, trained for the last few years um, in silversmithing, which I love the alchemy of sort of turning something into another object. I just, I, I love it. And, and that's led me in a, quite a different direction to sort of actually go outside and, and sort of walk into the garden. And now I'm training in landscape architecture, which seems completely unrelated, but it's actually not because it's about how you feel when you're in a space. Um, so, and I've seen through the students, they need to connect, they need to make. Um, in order to feel what it is they're doing. So I resonate with that completely. Yeah, yeah. And they, the films feel very intimate, don't they? Um, whilst performative, but it, it, they feel performative in a way that somehow is not demanding attention. I don't know what, what that is, but there's something intimate about the films. Um, as a way of sort of framing their work or reimagining their work. Um, I think that you have got to remember that, 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 you know, they quite often were making them not on their own, but like with the help of a friend or, you know, they're not professional films, you know, so there is an intimacy to them because it's their project. And so we're sort of getting a little glimpse, especially le um, layers when you just, it's her talking and it's so, you actually feel it and, She's, you, you, can, you can completely get that project, even if you've never met her or you don't know the project. Um, I think some of them may be a little more difficult, but we know the projects, um, but there is an intimacy, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I know that soon I'm going to open it up to, to questions, but I just, um, Naomi and, and Elko in particular, um, what I, I just wondered what your aspirations for the courses are. I mean, it's really a celebration of them today. And I think that we've all felt very moved by 
by the students' work, um, moved and, and in awe of their skills. Um, and I wonder whether, I mean, there are lots of words that come out in terms of the course, in terms of pushing the boundaries and as a provocation. And as, as practice-based research, you know, as something which is thinking through making, which you clearly, you know, both really, uh, you know, push, push in the best sense, the, the students to think differently and think through their materials. Um, I wondered if what your kind of hopes for the for the two courses are just before we open it up to perhaps other people's questions around this this incredible work. Okay, from my point of view, um, keep the diversity, um, which I think sometimes is a little bit under threat at the moment <laughs> in all respects. Um, so that involves also locality of thinking, locality um, of, of different types of students and bringing that out, perhaps even more in the course, um, preserving particular crafts or technologies could be a way of doing that, uh, particular ways of living, I guess, um, but also, um, uh, yeah, new, new, new technologies. So I think a wider, even, even, even wider variety. I think one point uh, somebody told me that um, it was difficult to pinpoint uh, a particular style to the MA footwear and the person asked if, that's clever, if that was clever to do. But I thought that was the whole point because if, if you've got, you know, if you bring out in someone who's different than the other person, the particular thing that they would like to do, then um, you automatically get a lot of diversity. Um, and a lot of different approaches. So um, anyway, I think it hopefully more and more diverse, bigger and more diverse. Thank you. What about you, Naomi? Um, similar, I suppose, although I, I feel I'd like to encourage more conceptualization of, of the projects of our students. I feel that they're very good at uh, nurturing their ideas and creating work that's beautifully put together and there's this very close relationship with the the studio methodologies and the concept development but not enough attention on where what's the trajectory of their work where are they going with this um, where can it where can it be positioned you know what's the life after so I want a bit more attention on, on the con context of these projects and collaboration and um, also bringing in more digital technologies than we have to date. Uh, Di Reese, who was, has been the course leader up until recently, um, since the concept of, of the opening of the course, has already began, he already set into place certain channels of, of context. And um, for example, performative prosthetics and performative or artifact as a political voice. Well. I'm interested also in, in nurturing the artifact as in, in terms of social protest or so, social justice. Um, and, and just to kind of, so I, I'm concerned that pro, student projects can be a little bit too introverted and, and personalized, intimate, yes. And I, I don't think that's a problem, but I would like them to be more, about, more aware of where they can put their work after, you know, where they can channel their professional trajectory after. Um, I mean, that's definitely, definitely to continue with this relationship with materials, studio manufacture, um, concept, the body, to continue as, but more focused, a bit more collaborative, a bit more digital. That's my hope. Um, I have another couple of questions up my sleeve, but if anyone wants to type questions into the chat box, technically we're in that, that uh, segment uh, of the session so if anybody would like to ask a question please do and if you uh, if you don't I can keep asking questions um, I mean one thing that that uh, occurred to me just now when you were talking about that reminded me of another of of something that I was thinking about watching the films and that is the word fashion because it's fashion artifact fashion you know it's 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 London College of Fashion, you know, it is in within a, a kind of 
the realm of fashion. And so by pushing these objects, are we in fact redefining fashion or are, are we exercising kind of experimental ideas that then can be harnessed by, um, by the fashion system or with the fashion system or are we, you know, because we're politicizing it um, and we're experimenting. But where does the where does the word fashion fit in, Georgina? I don't know. You nodded when I was saying that, and I just wonder because I think the, there is that kind of what do you do afterwards, and do we where do we assume the students are going when in fact we've exploded all these categories, um, and whether that is um, whether that's an easy transition then to make. Yeah, we're often asked, I mean, talking about the fashion artifact, we're often asked, what does that mean? And I quite enjoy the fact that people can't quite understand what that is. Um, um, because there's nothing worse than being defining something and then being stuck in a box, um, as, as I found out myself. And so, so I think the, the when I think about this word fashion, which I... I I feel uncomfortable to say that I work in the fashion industry because it comes with some many negative connotation. But the way I'm thinking about fashion when I'm working with the, the artifact students is that I'm thinking about it as we're fashioning onto the body, we're fashioning material in the sort of traditional crafted sense of fashion. And, and in terms of the footwear, I, you know, when people talk about shoes, sometimes we are making shoes or dealing with shoes, and, and, and but more than often, it's about asking what footwear can be, um, or what it isn't, or um, does it even foot, fit onto the foot, and therefore is it is it a shoe? So it's, it's these questions of this um, this ambiguous approach, which makes it much more exciting and less about of the students fitting into an industry. Now, of course, they need to get jobs. They want to get jobs. So our, we, they need the skills, the drawing, the computer skills more than, more than anything nowadays. So, but the actual word fashion, I do think we have to question it. Um, uh, like what it actually means on, in, in each course or in each, in each practice. Yeah, and I think at London College of Fashion there is a um, there is a desire to do that. I think yes. across the MAs we do we have conversations around you know we don't take it for granted as an object that everybody already you know understands. I mean, Joe, your experience obviously you studied on on a course that was described as fashion artifact, but you now you now describe yourself as an artist. So, do you want to comment on? On that sort of coming through a college, you know, London College of Fashion, and emerging um, in the way that you have. Yeah, I think um, it goes back in some way to um, what Naomi was saying about the body. Is that sometimes it is about the body being at the core, and the things that you're creating are um, projections from the body, and they do in some way clothe or exist or talk about um, objects that have a relationship back to fashion. Um, but I think also it's about that fashion is a cycle and a trend and that we're almost, um, I guess, I'm always thinking about trend in relation to social trend and how we kind of combine the two and how fashion is in that context no longer kind of frivolous and throwaway. Um, and yeah, and, and that it is, I guess, about conversations I had with Elko when I was a student about this idea of um, altering an object's implied function. And that one of the things that sometimes people struggle with is that a shoe is a shoe, it's meant to do this particular thing. And I think if you're going to change that implied function, you have to change it with something almost even bigger than itself. Um, and, and, you know, you have to really think about that, what that is. 
Um, so yeah, there's lots of there's lots of questioning, I guess, um, to be done. But fashion, um, I used to call myself conceptual fashion. Um, I think for all the students coming out of here, if you're going to carry on your practice, you're almost a perpetual student. You're continuing to question. You're doing. I feel like I'm doing an MA every day. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly questioning and recreating and thinking about if I was there now, what would I be doing? What am I challenging? And, and in terms of the digital, you know, looking at the changing art world and, the, and things like NFTs and how we might make money from um, digital work as well as physical work and how the two can live next to each other, how we can have wonderful crafted objects and augmented realities and what does that mean and the materiality side of it as well you know the, the rice work really spoke as all the work did in, in different ways to some of the things I'm experimenting with myself so yeah on all levels I think um yeah I, it's fashion because it, it relates to the the human the body and, and fashion's history in yeah. some way but being completely altered and challenged and crossed over with conceptual art practice. Um, but yeah, it's a big subject in its own right, I think. Well, yeah, absolutely. And we've got, we've got a couple of questions from the floor, so to speak. So one is, um, uh, as we continue to embrace and work with a more digital global learning experience, especially post COVID, can, should, or how, do any of the panelists visualize tactility being explored and encouraged in relation to digital and remote working and then translated into physical shared experience, especially after their experiences of teaching online over the last year. Some of the dissemination has been discussed in relation to the films, but any other ideas? Does anyone want to, to respond? Some of the things we've touched upon. I think um, I'd like to respond to that, thinking quite specifically about some of our teaching experiences. And I know that I share this with many, but um, we have been confronted with more silence, <laughs> a kind of a screen without images of, you know, without faces, cameras are off, mics are off. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about this, trying to not think about it as a neg in negative response, um, because, I mean, this is digital in terms of, the technological interaction. It's not digital in terms of anything more virtual, but I'm interested in the way we have experienced silence in lockdown through the screens. It doesn't mean that the students are not thinking. It doesn't mean the students are not engaged. Um, it's difficult to read that in a way that you can read a room full of people who are not responding verbally, but you can see they're, they're processing thinking responding maybe with facial expressions, gesticulation, I mean, whatever. But um, I think what the way that's made me think about moving forward is, is working with silence as a theme via the screen with students. So I think it's interesting um, to respond to the digital experience, if you like, and embed that in your practice. And in relation to me and my personal practice, the idea of silence as, as a negative space, if you like, is quite, is absolutely directly um, relative to themes in my work and themes in some of the students' work I've worked with also. Yeah. So that, that would be something I would consider. It's interesting in that, that even though in the question it was about sort of tactility as well, I think that in a way you've responded to the sound, which is also the timbre of the voice and the silence and the rhythm. So mm. again, it's about something that is is about the experience. It's about the the, the kind of emotional uh, atmosphere of something and how that might be um, lost or regained or transformed or translated. And we have another question that is also around the digital, which says, I mean, I know we're only a couple of minutes more. Um, and the, the other question is, I found the earlier suggestion of digital space being a new means of material exploration. Um, does this come into play in any of your own practices? And if so, how? So just the digital space as part of your experimentation. I've used it only once. And what were the circumstances? Um, well, I 
and, uh, and I created a virtual space, <coughs> experiential space for a therapeutic experience. Um, you know that that already as a proposal, let's say, um, for a therapeutic experience for phobias. Oh. Um, so you can do that in your private home, other than um, go to the doctor, because I think only ten people, ten percent of the people that have a phobia would go to the doctor. Um, so if virtual headsets become cheaper, um, then they could be either rented or people have them anyways, which is something you see already happening. Um, and it also means that um, in a more of a game uh, environment, as we're living in at the moment, uh, people are more receptive to, to play games at home and you can uh, it opens up possibilities for design and designing spaces in which those issues are addressed. Um, because they're, um, uh, yeah, but it, 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 it doesn't deal with a particular materiality of it. I think that was part of the question, but um, that's the only the only way I've used it. Um, at, on the on the course, it's used several times. Um, I think um, we've got a few seconds left. So I'm going to just take this opportunity to thank the panelists um, for your insights. It's been lovely to, to have you and everyone um, who I can't see, but uh, who's participated in this, uh, in this session this afternoon. And I hope everyone will watch the, the films um, online if you haven't already uh, done so and follow the, uh, the students' progress. Um, and I just thank you very much. I'll close the session. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.